Hello everybody, this is Carlos Ocelot, and wait, actually, I just realized them. Why the fuck is this thing swinging? I don't like when my chair swings, so I'm gonna lock it in there, and please don't cut that. I like it, I like to keep it real, production. Hello everybody, this is Carlos Ocelot, and welcome to the G2 Podcast. Today, we have yet another legend, and this guy, as, uh, as, as it often happens with, I don't know why is this, but... Uh, all the legendary Counter Strike shoutcasters, uh, everybody knows them, even if you don't follow Counter Strike. I really don't know why that is. Um, but this person is no other than Anders. How's it going, my man? <laughs> really well, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm having a I'm having a great day. It's really hot in Denmark, like it is in all of Europe. But uh, but I'm I'm kind of loving it, man. Right now, I'm good. How hot is in Denmark? It's like we're, we're getting close to like plus 30 degrees sometimes now, which Ooh. I mean, we're, we're Danish. We're not used to, you know, this kind of weather. So, uh, so everyone is suffering a little bit. Well, you know, I, I got completely lied when uh, when I got uh, sold, uh, you know, this Berlin dream. And, <laughs> <laughs> and and they told me, no, Berlin, you know, summer, don't worry. People don't 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 want to use uh, air conditioner, but you don't have to worry because it's never hot here. Well, let me tell you something. It's been, yesterday was 38 degrees Celsius. 38. Oh That's like God. Spain levels of heat. Yeah. And there is no AC anywhere. Like you literally have to go to a mall. That's how bad it is. And I, I actually yeah. tried to, to put AC at my home. And they will not allow, like my building has a rule against ACs because they look bad. And I literally have a big terrace in which I can hide the ACs. But because German you know, rules, you know, they're like yeah. very, this is the rules and we can't bend them. And uh, so here I am with no AC uh, trying to survive the summer. I never thought I would say that. Listen, it's the same in Denmark. I, I live in a house. I have my own house and I, I'm not even sure I can put an AC up because you have to get permission from your neighbors. Exactly. It's, too noisy. it's crazy. It's, it's, all the, it's actually mostly uh, this very safe uh, in terms of culture as well, um, European countries. It, yeah, it's it's you know Germany, like, a, lot, a lot of the Nordic ones, like they just they just you know they have a set of rules, and if you really want to bend them, you really have to like <laughs> you know type a letter to the government and things like that. Really try hard, right? Things that I will yep. never do. Like I will never write a letter in German, you know, uh, for no. that purpose. It's mental. I agree. <laughs> it's it, it's absolutely crazy. So anybody, uh, sorry. Anyway, um, I we don't have any kind of framework set for the podcast. We just good. I like that. We just talk. And important, I I, I know you're not too much into uh, cursing. You're a you're a fairly uh, well spoken man. For the I can part. keep it cool. Yeah? Usually, most of the time, yeah. But but if something slips, you don't have to worry. And All right. For each each one you make, I'll make ten. So uh, don't don't, <laughs> wor <laughs> don't worry right. about that too much. Um, so first of all. I always uh, like to ask a question that I actually um, heard in a podcast from Tim Ferriss that it was an amazing question, which is that, is there any moment that, uh, and, and it gets really deep, uh, like, for, you know, the first question gets really deep already. <laughs> yeah, like, let's is go. There, is there any moment in your life that defined either your career or who you are? Um, and and I, guess, I guess that can be anything, but uh, anything you kind of recall. Uh, I think I had a really big defining moment um, summer in school. I had a I had a very bad time in school in general. By the way, I do love Tim Ferriss, so I'm, I'm happy that you watched that show. Oh, he's amazing. absolutely amazing. Yeah, Pff, he's, he's uh, incredible. He, yeah, he's just one of those guys, right? So it's it's I, I enjoy that. We should talk about that at some point. But um, oh. so I had a very bad time in school, and I had convinced myself that the only the only thing that I was good at was English. I was always pretty good at that, and then. Everything else I just thought I couldn't do. And I remember in Denmark, I guess it's the same everywhere, but around the ninth grade is when you have like your, you know, the finals to, to exit elementary school and yeah. then you go on to do high school or something else. So, so I actually, I remember thinking, I'm probably not going to make those finals. I just remember thinking I, I, there's almost no chance I can pass, you know, the ninth grade. I just thought it's not going to happen and I'm not going to be able to do it. So I just thought. What what I actually wonder what happens to you if that doesn't happen? Like what where do you end up in society? I remember thinking a lot about that, and then I thought I don't know how, but I I started thinking about sort of each individual topic. So I thought about like history, like am I really the worst in this in my class at history? And I thought oh, 
probably not. Like there are some people that know a little bit less I can think of than I did. And then I thought, well, what about, you know, Danish, which is just like, you know, learning how to spell and write in Danish. So no, you know, I could kind of, that wasn't the best, but I could kind of do that. And then physics, I was, I was really love physics. I wasn't necessarily like a genius at it. I just thought it was very interesting. And then like, I, as I kept summing up all the different things, I realized I'm, I'm not the worst in any of these things. Like I, you know, I don't even have to be the best. I just have to realize I'm not the worst. And for the logic to work, for for the logic to work that I wasn't going to pass the ninth grade, it would have to mean that like 10 or 15 other people also wouldn't be able to pass in some way. And I just realized at that point that that was ridiculous and that I had built some kind of mental pr prison for myself where I just kept sort of telling myself that I wasn't going to be able to do it. And then I just, even just that mental change did so much for me. And I started to like, I thought, I think I always tried, but like my trying did had different results once I started thinking differently about it. And I, you know, I made it out of ninth grade and I ended up going to high school. I ended up doing like A levels, math and biology and English and like a bunch of other things. And I had just a really good time doing it. Um, and I, I, I really fell in love with the idea of math and physics and I got really deep into that and thought it was cool. Um, so that's probably, a, that's probably a really big change that, that happened early on in my life. Now, I don't know if that impacted my casting career later on, but that, that was the th That's first awesome. thing that came to mind. Such a really nice moment. So, for example, in which moments do you still use that uh, trick, so to say? Like, I mean, I'm not the worst. So, you know, it's like a, it's a pretty good barrier, actually, to, to get depressed over over not being the best all the time, you know? Or yeah, I, 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 I kind of use it in both ways because, I, I, I mean, obviously, I, I try and say, okay, I'm, I, I want to be, you know, better than whoever is the worst. Like, I don't even think you can find that one person. It's just like a concept, right? But um, but I try and do it the opposite way too as well to say that being the sort of, if your goal is to be the best, it's just a very, it's very, like, it, I think it's fine as like a, a, a waypoint that you can use that you can say, well, I'm going to try and get up towards that level. But if you're only happy when you can somehow prove that you're the best, then that just seems like a very easy way to stay unhappy most of the time so i try and like use those are just markers in my life to try and say let's not try and be the worst let's not try and be the best let's try and see how how well we can do somewhere in the middle uh yeah i mean that's really important that's something that i have to to think a lot about in casting because you know for a while i think you could say that that you know similar and i were like the best at casting counter-strike and then we ended up getting, you know, a lot of competition for that spot. And now Hen Henry and Selkist are like the most popular duo right now. And if you if you keep if the only thing that makes you happy is being at that top level in, in esports and in casting, you're gonna it's gonna be such a bad time. It's not even gonna be fun. So yeah, I think to some level, some extent I think that, that lesson still makes makes some sense to me. It seems to me like um, this way of thinking is definitely going to make you uh, overall happier uh, than than <laughs> Um, you know, yeah, the, the most ambitious people I know, um, they, they are happy because they like the journey. Uh, and, and, you know, it happens to me many times that I like the journey yeah. of that hardship. But it is true that it's like living in a constant state of pressure and stress. And that's literally 24 7. So I, yeah. I, I can see what you say. I can definitely see kind of that being a good thing. And at the end of the day, the less stressed you are um, and the more fun you're having, the more creative you become and the more you kind of uh, maybe not work, not work that much on your craft, but come up with new, new shit that, you know, and, and yeah. kind of keep being original with the ways you cast or the ways you approach your, your job. Um, it, it did that. So do you consider yourself somebody creative when it comes onto your job? Yeah. I mean, I, it's almost, it's almost a bit of a of a curse to me is that I, I like I don't I can't exactly explain why but like my my mind just wants to it, you know come up with new ideas all of the time. That's awesome. Um, well, yeah, it it is, but it's also it can also be really frustrating because there's just not enough time um, and there's not I don't have enough resources or know enough of the right people and even if I knew those people like. Most of the time, they will have other projects that they're working on. So, like, my dream, I mean, I, th I think I tweeted this on my... I really wish I had the resources and knew all of the engineers and all of the graphics artists and all of the, like, all of the people that I needed to know so that every time I had an idea, I could, I could like, assemble a little group of people. I could say, okay, this is the idea now. Tell me 
why it's not going to work. Tell me why it's you know not a good idea. Tell me like all the things that that will stop us from doing this. But then if we can't come up with some good like a good reason why, then let's try and build this. You know, let's try and do something. And I mean, like I I'm working on I'm uh, working on a big project now, which is a software startup project that I've been doing for for a while now, and. I'm really struggling to keep the focus on that and not invent other ideas while I'm doing this because it's, it's like it's just it, it becomes kind of an obsession at some point. But yeah, I, I don't always succeed in doing that. Like sometimes you, something. New the happens. problem is that you have a lot of input from the world in general, and you have people that have succeeded doing one thing, and you have people that have succeeded doing many things at all times. So I think that it's just a matter of your nature, right? Um, and and kind of embracing whatever it is that your nature is. So if, uh, this is what I say, I'm, I'm no expert, but if you feel like trying new stuff all the time, just try new stuff all the time until you hit the key, you know, until you hit the button, the right button. I think, I mean, I'm super lucky in that I have, you know, more resources than, than I think if I was, if I was working a more regular job, like I have access to more people, I have probably a little bit more money than, than the average person. So in that sense, like I, I, I have a more of a chance to test things, but you know, my, like I said, my dream is like, let's say the software project works out the way that I want it to. And, and, you know, I make a lot of money on it or something along those lines, then like a lot of that money is going to be spent on building new projects, like fairly soon afterwards, there's going to be like different weird things going on. Um, so that's kind of my dream. Like that's, that, that's really what I hope to, to end up with. And I think also more than that is if you're just somebody who has like a lot of crazy ideas and none of them have ever like make it through the assembly line. None of them have ever made production and, and have turned out to actually work in real life. If you keep, you know, telling people about your crazy ideas, like I, I do all the time uh, to everybody that I know, people kind of do have a sort of an attitude that says like, yeah, okay, like we get it. Like it's another idea. Cool. And I, I understand why, you know, because it obviously becomes <laughs> like, you know, like every, every other month there's like something else that I'm talking about. And the problem is, the problem is like you i almost want to have like that one idea that proves itself and the next time i come and tell people hey what about this idea they'll say oh you know well yeah that one good idea maybe maybe we should listen to them a bit more you know so they're like it's there's a lot on the line right now and it's a little bit crazy but it yeah, is it's, fun it's, and I right. like, it, it's so funny because um there's just so there's a thin line that separates the crazy from the genius right and yeah. and <laughs> it's probably that one success story and then everybody takes you serious. You know, I, I, there's, there's a, <laughs> this is a, a, a good analogy, but completely off topic. But this is like when you go to the, <laughs> when you go to the gym and see a guy that is like super skinny and like has nothing and he's doing the exercise wrong, like you, you're like, <laughs> yeah. okay, that guy has no fucking idea. But if you see a super buffed guy that is like kind of twisting his arm in a way that he shouldn't or whatever, you're like, it doesn't matter. I mean, he, he's like that big. So he probably has some kind of plan around it, you know? And yeah. same goes here, you know? Like you, ha you come up with the stupidest idea, but if you have, um, I mean, and I have, I have a lot of stupid ideas, a lot of them, a huge amount of, most of them are stupid. And yeah, mine too. <laughs> and and, and I, I don't know if fortunately or unfortunately, Everybody or many people around me clap like, oh, that's a nice idea, you know, and it's like, you know, th there's a world in which it, it's not, you know, just challenge, challenge a yeah. little bit, you know, the idea. Uh, so it's unfair. It's actually very unfair. But like uh, there's Mark Cuban said once, you only have to be right once, you know? Yeah. And I, I think that's probably true. And I mean, it's it, it's just very tricky. Uh, listen, the, we've got time. I'll tell you one of the ideas as quick as I can. This one I feel oh, comfortable I love sharing because... I don't actually think it's ever going to happen, or if it is, then fine. You know, it's it's not a problem. But so you know, you know those, you know those like uh, globes that you have like in a library or something, or maybe like an old library that yeah. has like you know the yeah. you know the Earth, and usually they're quite outdated, as in they were made like a hundred years ago. So maybe you know it says you know USSR instead of Russia or something like that, or like you know the, some of the borders are a bit wrong, especially if they're really old. Mm -hmm. So I I always really enjoy looking at those. I thought. Wouldn't it be cool if you could make like a digital version of it? So instead of it being like a you know wooden ball, it's actually like a, a a spherical screen. And then you can you can obviously it's a touch screen. So like let's say it's not this this big, but it's you know like a giant one, like even bigger than this. And then you could, as you could touch it, you could move the Earth around. Like that would be fun in itself. And then you could you could say it would stay updated. So if you know borders change or a country changes its name or a capital gets moved somewhere else. And, you know, that information would stay updated. And I thought, 
But if that was true, then you could also go back in time. So you could say, oh, let me see the let me see the movement of the Danish and German border from you know current time to 300 years ago. And then it would play out like it's a little historical battle of the border going up and down through whatever wars that have been. That sounds thought, pretty fun. <laughs> yeah. I thought you could also do this with like, you know, basic weather. So you could see like, you know, with the weather around the globe being sort of animated onto the screen. I thought you could also do this for geological times. So you could say, well, I want to scroll back, you know, in the order of, you know, 200,000 years at a time. And I want to see all the continents move as they move about. And I could do this as species of population, like, you know, yeah, let me see species. the migration of, yeah. yeah you, so all this data, you could like, you could pack an enormous amount of data into this thing. And obviously the problem is who on earth would buy this, you know, because right. it would obviously be... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would, I would probably buy it. <laughs> right. So, and th- I, I tried to solve that problem as well. And I told myself, like, what if we could, what if I could sell it to FedEx or Delta or something so that they could track their packages or Amazon or... You know, if it's if it's Delta, then they could see like all their aircraft moving around, animated, cool, and they, it would be some sort of like statement that they could have in their main office, and each of them would cost like you know five hundred million or something. Like, you know, but it would be like I I tried to solve that problem, but the problem is my strength in all of this is not like business. I am not somebody who's like very good at coming up with that. I, I think I, I I've got more and more and more respect for people who are good at it. I used to think of it as like sort of an annoying side thing that had to happen. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, those business I people. I used to they, as well, yeah. Yeah, but the more I work with those people, the more I realize it isn't, it, it isn't like that. And, it, and actually, it can be quite interesting to, to sort of dig into it a little bit. But it's just not my expertise. So, yeah, I always dreamt of building that, you know, spherical touch screen that could be like, a, you know. Like you you some, see, the, this idea is the perfect example where nobody like people watching don't know where where in the line you stand you know <laughs> like, are you in the left or on the right of the line you know like, no, yeah. nobody knows nobody knows and and i love that actually that, that's very nice that's very very <laughs> nice it's it's batshit crazy and this case yeah. is just ideas that uh like I, I can see how you probably read uh fantasy books or something like that uh, or or kind of books that uh, evoke those nice thoughts actually I don't, this is the worst thing. I'm not even always sure how it happens. Like I'll, I'll be, I'll just be doing something and then suddenly like an idea happens and I think, oh, maybe, maybe someone could do that. And then I try and think of all the ways in which it wouldn't work myself, because if I can, like, if I can dismiss it myself easily, then I don't have to spend any more time on it. You know, as soon as I realize, oh, this idea has some sort of major problem that makes, that makes it completely impossible, then fine, I'll just move on. But if I can't do that, I, I usually like I go for months and I think about it. I can't like get rid of the idea. And then I, I end up having to share it with people. So I say, hey, what about, you know, could someone build this? Wouldn't this be a fun idea? Um, and eventually, it go, sometimes it goes a bit further. I had an idea for a, for a particular feature in a mouse that I actually like. I ended up building a prototype and like, you know, trying to. Oh, my talk, God. Yeah, I talked to different companies about it, too. And they... I actually, I always assume as well, this is a, I always assume that somebody else will have thought of this because there are a lot of people in, on like, you know, on the earth. So chances are someone else has probably thought of something similar and maybe even better. So I always think that, but the companies I talked to them actually hadn't considered this idea. And I, you know, they, they weren't even dismissive, but they just said they weren't willing to take risk in production, which, you know, fair enough, you know, if you have to, if you have to get a company in China or a factory in China, to build a hundred thousand, you know, editions yeah. of some, some new mouse, then that's a pretty big risk. And for me, with the idea, it's like no risk at all. I can just say, "Call it." I think it'll work. Let's try it. You know, well, one of, one of the ideas around mouse that that I was thinking about, and um, I mean, it's not, I don't even. I tried to look for it, but and there's something that exists, but it's pretty bad. There, if there was a mouse that allowed you to keep exactly somehow exactly the same sensitivity from game to game. Like yeah. through the mouse, without adding any application or anything, I would I would probably I would probably like to have that mouse because it's so annoying when you like play Counter Strike and then play like Fortnite or play like Overwatch or whatever. There's yeah. all, you have to always kind of try to pick up the sensitivity again, and it's so bad because I'm pretty sure that if you go by the millimeter, you will you actually have uneven sensitivities across different games which is completely fucked up yeah no yeah absolutely it's like that will definitely mess around with the muscle memory right but there's also another thing like you know the mouse was really early on in computer development someone came up with that idea like for 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 apple or macintosh back in the day right now 
what are the chances that that really that the first attempt to make something to control like a, a graphic interface instead of the the DOS prompt? What are the chances that that was like the best way to do it? Yeah, like it, it just seems so unlikely yeah, that yeah. the first invention is the best one. So that's actually that is is a different thing that I sometimes think about on on in my spare time. Is like we must be able to come up with something better than this. Like there must be a better way for it. Like. And obviously, people have tried where it's like a glove that you put on, and then it's like there's a surface that's like a mouse pad. But that's what you. There, are, there are lots of attempts to do it, but like, it really oddly feels like someone just like got that idea, and then it was the best one. And I can't really explain why, but it's. But I. It just these is. are the things that. Yeah, these are the things I think about all, like all the time. No, but it, it's true with a lot of uh, things that got. Uh, so a lot of things that exist today are many times a byproduct, if not almost always, a byproduct of the first product. Which, yeah. of course, is has uh, fundamentals that are not the most effective or the best. And one of them could be this. And uh, I'm pretty sure if you look at uh, the way phones work or the way XYZ works, uh, nobody is willing to innovate too much because that would require that everybody else changes the way in which they operate their phones or whatever it is too much. That's, what, that's not yeah. something you want to change because, you know, everything is kind of standardized at the moment in many of these... Uh, uh, tools or products and you don't want to like break the norm too much because then that product is not going to do very well uh, so yeah you, you really need most of the time incremental change exactly to, to move something somewhere else exactly oh, and it's also i mean i think there's also another feature which is something like once something has been established as the way to do things like smartphones yeah. and touch screens once once that happens it just becomes so hard to think outside of that yeah 100 like, percent with you yeah it's yeah. like it's really weird like your brain just automatically says well that's how it has to be now i will try and think of you know something outside of it it's very hard to 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 remove all of your assumptions about how something is supposed to work and then try and think about it from the ground up uh, yeah. like that's very very tricky. this is probably one of the main reasons why monopolies or un unregulated monopolies are 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 really tough to deal with because there's a monopoly and that means that there's a huge barrier of entry so that means that the playground in which you build your company upon is on different worse terms or worse kind of uh, field than your yeah. competitors that are already existing and then that means that uh, you, you you can't kind of uh, be creative enough and original enough with the products you, you generate and you have so much just so many obstacles and so many barriers um, and you don't want to be that guy that comes up with a product nobody buys uh, after having raised 150 million from different investors. You just don't want to be that guy, right? Because then the, your yeah. career is over. Um, and uh, I mean, almost to some extent, even worse is the fact that even if you, like, even if you were the guy, if there exists a monopoly already, let's say that all ma mouse production or mice production in the world was just like one company, mm -hmm. then if you came up with the idea that was going to destroy that monopoly. Chances are they have so much money that you know you won't be able to refuse them buying it from you. Yeah, they, so then they, they, they'd, they'd buy they'll, you up. Yeah, they definitely like, buy that's, you. That's a big problem, right? There's um, a there's an, do, do you know? Because you said you watched the Tim Ferriss show. So do you do you know of Eric Weinstein? He was on the show at one point. I I think I I uh, what what does he do? What does he do? He is he is the uh, he's the director of uh, something called Teal Capital. Peter Teal, who's the, the, the millionaire or billionaire, whatever he is. Um, he um so Eric is a mathematician and just I think generally a fascinating person and he he had this challenge to like fans of his that which was to try and reinvent an umbrella. He, his point was that the umbrella is just like a stupid tool that it, it doesn't work very well even if it rains and like you know you take it inside and it's all wet. So you, so his challenge and this is this is kind of like a riff on you know coming up with new ideas to and say maybe somebody could invent like a new umbrella and and I I watched that podcast like. I don't know, four months ago or something. And that's been on my mind. Like, ever since, all I can think about is like, how do, how do we change like the, um, because that's like, that's like, if you do that, then, you know, you could, you won't even need incremental change. If you change the way that an umbrella works so that you make up something that's like easier to store and it doesn't get wet the same way and it works better in the wind and whatever other, yep. you know, things you need in an umbrella, then it, it could change overnight, right? Like, you know, next year, that could be the only thing sold in the umbrella department. So, I, I I just like things like that. And I, you know what, you know, the, what I, the main problem is? Is that not that many, not that I'm thinking about. If you look at peripherals, for example, most of the peripheral companies, like you have everything you can think about that is not some of the biggest players. They copy what already exists, right? And they just yeah. change it one, two percent and add a 
<laughs> a fanatic logo into it and then uh, and then you know you have a different product but it's not really a different product it's literally the same product as this other company uh, you know that did the exact yep. same mouse and, and the problem with that is that yeah it, there is like an artificial perception that there is a lot of choices but there's not it's li- it literally nope. is the same product over and over replicated just with slightly different shape or slightly different kind of colors or anything like that um, and yeah. and that kills that kind of creativity and will to change things. But yeah, that mouse. Yes, I, I would get it. I, I would um, get it. I listen. I it's it's kind of an idea that can be replicated too. I think like maybe even headsets and keyboards too. But it's like 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 I said, the problem is I don't I don't really have the credibility. Like the people listening to this, obviously they might have some sense that I've come up with some genius idea, but that might not even be true. Like I mean, for all I know, it's not a genius idea, and and I've just gone a little bit crazy. But like I said, I would love to be in the position at some future point where people say, you know, oh well, if we get an email from Anders talking about some new crazy idea, we should really just we should really read it. We should really be sure to say, okay, this might be actually be something that we wanna we wanna look at. Well, but I understand. I understand that you need to prove yourself, and I, like that's what I hope to do. You know. I mean, yeah, I, I think you do have a lot of credibility uh, because at the end of the day, you understand game mechanics really well. Counter Strike is one of the games, if not the game, with the best mechanics all around in, in esports. Like those, the game design, the mechanics, the the recoil is just perfect. Yeah. There's no shooter, and will never be a shooter like Counter Strike in this regard. And you, you master that game. So you understand game mechanics, at least in, when it comes into shooters, really, really well. You understand you've been a gamer for a long, long time in your career, which, by the way, it's not something to underestimate. Like This has a lot of value uh, <clears throat> because you understand game design. You understand what fans like, the trends. You know, you've been probably playing for the last 15 years, uh, if not more, yeah. and, and which means that you've seen ca- games come and go. So now you see Fortnite and you're like, yeah, you know, I'm probably not that excited because I've seen maybe not to this degree, but different fortnights come and go in the past, you know? So all these things create a, a pattern recognition on your end, which is a skill by itself. So starting off from that standpoint, you do have that credibility, much more than if anybody from the NFL that has closed billions of dollars in deals has, uh, at least when it comes into gaming. And now the point number two is, uh, what differentiates then the the most of the crazy guys from the guys that get shit done and really are like the gods, right? Look at Elon Musk or or look at Steve yeah. Jobs. Like these guys are just product guys. These guys are no different than 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 you in terms of they are either love physics or either love uh, you know uh, maths or either love uh, they, they always try to fix whatever problem they see and they have an yeah. initial idea and they're dictatorial in the way they uh, lead their companies. So you, the, the, the skill you probably gotta learn is how do I put all of that into practice? And I, I'm telling you, it's daunting to think about it, but it's not as hard. It's just, you know, do the first thing, uh, fail and uh, just learn and then create a bigger group and do a, the next thing and then create a bigger group and then do the next thing and you slowly yeah. build that reputation, you know, of, of getting shit done uh, and, and finalizing that shit. So I think you can be that guy. I mean, the, the, my my perception from what you are and what you do is that you could very well be that guy. I I hope so. I mean, and I mean, already now, just with the software stuff that I that I'm doing, you know, I realize that part of the game to some extent is that you know what people to call when you need money. If you need money, like you learn what people are interested in certain things, and and you know, if you do the next project or the next one down your list of people to potentially call sort of grows and grows and grows over time. And then, you know, it just becomes much easier to, to do that. So I, I agree to some extent, my chair going down. Um, I agree to some extent that, um, that yeah, you know, it, it is just about sort of continuing to, to, to go and, and move forward. And like I said, um, you know, once the first project has been like, you know, seaborne, once it's out there and we'll see what happens, then I guess we'll just find out if, if there's going to be more to come. Right. Um, I'm super optimistic about it. I think it's going to be great. And yeah, I just, it's, it's, it's just been so much work that I can't wait to get it on the way. How old are you right now? Uh, sorry. Second. How old are you right now? I am 32. 32. So yeah. Uh, You're really, really, really young. I thought you were older for some reason. Really young. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, um, I don't know. I, 
I can't figure out. I, th I actually, now we talked about this thing about, you know, life changing things. There is, there is another thing that I think is universal. I, almost everyone I know when I say this says, oh yeah, I kind of recognize that maybe except for a few people, but <laughs> I lived such a large part of my life under the delusion that whatever things I wanted to accomplish, it was kind of too late because it, it was like I had started too late in the race to get to where it, where it is I wanted. So mm -hmm. I kept looking around me and I looked at all these other people and like, oh, they were already like on the third year of college and I was just starting and like maybe, you know, they were the same age as me and they had sort of some sort of head start. And, you know, if I really wanted to become a, you know, a, I don't know, PhD in mathematics, then I would have had to have started much earlier. Like I kept telling myself like all these reasons that it was kind of too late and I, I stopped doing that quite a while ago, but I, but that was, I'd, I'd spent maybe like all of my twenties almost just thinking that all of those things were kind of like a little bit too late. And like, I, I don't know why, and it's like a stupid thing to do, but I realized so many people do that. Like an enormous amount of people think that whatever things they want out of life, that they've somehow missed the boat on that. And it, like, even and like, you know, when I started doing that, I was super young, right? Like I was, you know, in high school or something. And I, I was a little bit older than some of the people in high school. So I thought, you know, oh, well, these people, like they're going to be, you know, much quicker at all this stuff than I am. And like, it's really silly, but, um, you, you yeah. remember that movie um, that um, I can't remember what the name was, but I think it was Jim Carrey. I'm not entirely sure. I could be wrong, but it was about saying yes to whatever it was that was coming to you. Yeah. You remember yeah. that movie? I Vaguely, vaguely. I, I'm give, really give, me, give me a second. Production. How was that movie called? That um, I don't know if it was Jim Carrey or whatever, but it, you had to say yes to... Uh, whatever it is, opportunity that was coming to you, even if it was some... Yes, man. What? Yes, man. Yes, man. Yeah, I, I was. I thought it was going to be called... I mean, I, that's the name I was I was going to say, but it was like, no, that, that's too obvious. So, yes, man. It's called Yes, man. Um, I should check that out. I, I think I may have watched it at some point. Man, but that I'm movie so is amazing. And at the end of the day, we uh, the, the, only, the only way you... Uh, from my own experience, actually... The only way I ever felt, or the only moments I ever felt that I missed my train in some areas is because I did not put this movie, so to say, in practice, you know? And yeah. Many times you're like, um, I don't want to go out, uh, but there's this dinner and these people are cool. I mean, I'd rather stay here um, doing X, Y, Z and chilling yeah. but then it's like on the other hand like that's the boy the voice that is fear of uh, fears change right and then there's yeah. the other voice which is the one i t i used i mean sorry i i learned to listen to the last eight to ten years that is like you know i may i i may not have like the you know uh, i may not want to go right now but the truth is that it's a different plan i will maybe do this kind of plan once a year or maybe i never did it before so it's something new so it's just an experience that I will not forget at least, right? And and then I will just say, okay, let, then let's go, you know? And then I go, yeah. and that turns out to be one of the most defining moments in my career or in my life. And so it's just, I guess what worked uh, uh, for me is just saying yes to a lot of these things and kind of convincing yourself to say yes to a lot of these things. Moving yeah. to a new country, well, if, if you can afford it because your family will follow you or whatever, and this is a great job opportunity uh, and you are, oh, well, I have a home. You have, you can find a thousand excuses and I can find yeah. a thousand counter excuses. Well, you can rent that home, then go to a different country to live, maybe learn a new language, maybe, you know, learn new cultures and blah, blah, blah. And all of that goes into your CV, the, the career CV and the life CV, so to say. And all of that yeah. adds up. And at, at some point you stop giving a shit about change. And at some point you're like, change? I just embrace it. Oh shit, I haven't moved in two years. What am I doing with my life? You know, and then you want to move again, you know? And and I yeah. have, that's the shift that I feel makes you, it's probably the only way for me, at least, to not feel bad about having lost opportunities or whatever. Yeah, and I mean, I think the the only thing where I feel like maybe I had, I had like a some sort of good start in life is that, the, the kind of mentality that you would need to, to try and embrace some of those things is like some sort of basic confidence or belief in yourself that, you know, even if it's scary or something, it'll it like, it'll kind of work out or like I can, I can bring something to this project or to this. That's this how great way to put it. Yeah. That, that like, 
that something will like maybe kind of do this. And I actually, I think I had, even in school, like, I probably had some sort of basic feeling like that. And I have actually tried since to figure out what my parents, if, if it's their fault, like what, what my parents did to, to do that. And I don't know, I wish I knew because it would be really great to be able to replicate that with my, my own kid now, you know. I'm not 100% sure, but I've, but I've noticed this in other people. I've seen other people in my life, like, you know, all of the time where they don't have that. And the result on them is really, it's kind of devastating, right? Because they, you can just tell that they're it's not, they death. won't, yeah, they won't try things. Like, yeah, they, they're never going to do it. Yeah, it's really awful. And I, yeah, like I said, I wish I knew because it would be a great way to be able to help people if you find out somehow. At the end of the day, you carry yourself everywhere you go. And that is for the good and the bad, right? Yeah. Uh, and and you say no to whatever, I mean, you say yes to whatever opportunity. And maybe it's like a double-edged sword. It's like higher upside and lower down, I mean, and higher downside. Um, yeah. If you fail or if you succeed. But at the end of the day, what's the worst case scenario? Like, I, that's what I always ask. Like, I either ask myself, what's the alternative or what's the worst case scenario, right? And in yeah. this case, it would be the worst case scenario. And I'll be like, well, what's the worst case scenario? I lose it all. If I do this move and my company just implodes, uh, I lose the company. Okay, well that sounds that sounds bad, but this is it? Does it does it sound bad? I mean, I carry myself with me, so the same way I build this before, I can build it again, or I can build something yeah. uh, similar again because I carry myself with me. And yeah. once you break through that fear, it's like man, it's fucking. It's like sometimes you know if uh, if I would believe in this law of attraction thing that that many people talk about for now almost a decade i would i would be scared of my own self because sometimes i'm fantasizing about losing it all and and and, and yeah. showing everyone that i can have the same things i have today in 2 years after that moment <laughs> like you know what i mean like it's just so fucked yeah, up yeah, yeah. but when you feel so free like that is you just it's just pure freedom like at this point yeah. I like I don't think twice about what to say because I I know my heart is in the right place so I just say things. That's why I maybe yeah. curse too much. That's why I maybe blah blah blah. But that's who I am and I embrace it and you know I open my arms and this is how I am. And and that's freedom. So this could take us down a, like a very strange path but one of the things that I've been trying especially in the last year and a half maybe a little bit more is the kind of the kind of thinking that you just explained where you sort of say oh well you know, what if, what if I make the wrong move? What if I, what if I, you know, say the wrong thing, then what will happen in the future? I mean, for me, that kind of thinking would be like, oh, what if I, what if I mess up on camera? What if, you know, this tournament run doesn't like me anymore? What if, you know, I, I, you know, piss off the wrong people and, and then they won't hire me in the future. And what happens to me, and I think what happens to like an, an enormous amount of people is I spent almost all of my time living in like, in like some sort of you know constructed future like it's not actually happening right now but i have like i'm building all these like scenarios in my mind about what might happen if i don't do the right thing or if i if something goes wrong and it becomes it becomes an awful way to be alive because you know you're just living in like these horror fantasies about what's going on in the future and like you don't ever sort of stop and say well actually right now things are pretty good you know right now people like me i'm doing a good job and you know like you never get to sort of enjoy that part of it and true. I, I really realized that a lot, like in the last year and a half, and I started to try and change my thinking a lot and try and say, you know what, the things that are going to happen in the future, like, it's also crazy to assume that you can control all of them. Like some things are just Impossible. beyond your control. Impossible. So let's just like not think about it too much, you know, like, let's just try and say, like, I'll do the things right now that I can, that I'm good at controlling and I have my plan and I'll try and adapt the way that I can. But I don't want to like create a, a bunch of what ifs in the future because all it does is make me nervous and and makes me less happy right now and it's just like that that's been a bit of a change in my own thinking recently so it's it is is it kills my brain cells that actually some people hate like the word hate Elon Musk like <laughs> he's literally he's literally saving humanity okay and maybe he's not saving humanity but at least he's doing things that in the worst case scenario would potentially remotely save humanity. So, and, and people are still, you know, especially Wall Street, you know, they hate him. They just hate him. Yes. Like it's just, well, everybody will, everybody has haters as long as you're somewhat relevant. And in your position where 
it, like in my eyes, you're one of the best casters of all time, period. Thank you. Period. Thank you. Which is, by the way, really fucking tough for a non-English native uh, speaker. Really. It's, 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 it's so tough to, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to explain, but the, the, the slang, the, you know, it's everything. It's, it's, yeah. you know, the smoothness in which we speak, all those things. You just, you probably worked your ass off to get to where you are today, you know? And, and just being in that position, you, you have, I'm telling you, you have a lot of haters. I mean, even though they may not be as oh, yeah, or whatever, but you do have a lot of haters. Like, I don't know how, I don't like how he overreacts every time someone makes a, you know, bro, it's okay. You know, it's, it's just how it is. You know, everybody has haters. And if you wouldn't have haters and you'd be doing something, you'd be relevant. And that's not what you want to be. So just to, just to follow up on, quickly before I get to that, just on the, on the Elon Musk thing, I think even if, even if Elon doesn't end up saving all of humanity, I still feel like there's something else that I'm, that's really interesting that I think people will start to notice. And I, at least I've been noticing a lot is that there's like a mental change in how a lot of people have started to try to have like, try and have slightly bigger dreams. Yeah. Like there was a point, you, you hit the nail in the head. It, it's really interesting. Like there was a point in time where like, you know, when the space race was happening and like, you know, people were sending like rockets to Mars or like rockets to the moon and all that, or, you know, the, all those cool things. Right. And then it's like, there was a long period of time where nothing happened. Like everyone, like all the, all the creativity, all the like, you know, let's You're do something. You're giving me this. goosebumps, bro. Yeah, like all of that just went away. And then what you're, I think what you're seeing now is that it's starting to come back. There are more and more people now are saying, actually, we, we, we really could live in, a, in an age where people can invent cool stuff and they can, like, they can come up with something nice and it, it may be crazy, but let's just try and do it anyway. And I think, it's, um, I think that's, that's going to be a, a big mental change that's probably going to happen. And I hope more and more and more because it's so much more fun to live in that world, even if, like, even if it's just a mental state of mind to say we can really like create great things if we just like if that becomes the culture then we can do it again you know we don't have to just you know sort of you know meddle around with our little everyday jobs all the time and that's the only thing that goes on that could be like a larger cultural change i think towards that um and of, of course i will attract you know haters and you know i i get them too and i don't even always mind that much i don't think it's so bad you, you should like it, no, it's it's okay, you know. Like I, most of the time, the people who who criticize me, I've noticed because I actually made a point of doing this quite like even from the beginning. If somebody messages me on, you know, wherever on Reddit or on Twitter or somewhere, and, and they catch me, and, and someone will say, and so, most of the time, it's not even directed like directly to me. It's just a comment about me that they don't know that I'm reading. But th it'll be something like, "Yeah, I really think Anna's just awful at this, and I think it's the worst when he does this," and then. Sometimes I'll reply to those people and I say, listen, uh, can, can you give me an example? I'm really curious about it. I want to improve. So could you give me something to work with here? And then people, the first thing you will say is, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know you were reading this. And I realize now that I'm reading my own comment back that it was a little bit harsh. And here's just what I think. So actually, <laughs> I actually think most of the time people are, they're not as malicious. It's just the way that people talk on the internet, right? But when it comes down to it, they're, they're not that aggressive. Like they're not that, you know, out to get you. It's just that. They don't think about the idea that someone might be out there. Reading uh, I'm telling you, it's, it's called habits and people yeah. fall into the habit of uh, being, let me try to find the right word for this, but people get uh, into habits that, that make them default into entertaining themselves by shitting on anyone, anyone. And they may not be bad persons. They just fall into that bad habit. Yeah, I don't think they are. Uh, no, it, it really, like, you know, it, it, it happens all the time. Like you meet these people and just, this guy is, uh, I was about to say the C word, but the C word would be something that maybe production would have to cut afterwards. So I would not say <laughs> the C word, but you, you're, you're, you're a, like, you know, this guy is like acting like a really bad person. And then you meet him in person uh, in some event or something. And the guy is the sweetest person ever, but they just get entertained by their own bad habits. And they go to Twitter and rumble about everything, about, rumble about the president, rumble about the X, Y, Z. They just rumble all the time. And they just build this, uh, you know, this 24-7 state of negativity. And you speak to them and it's always, it's, they're always uh, busy in a bad way. They're always being underpaid. They're always being in bad jobs. They're always just, just tired about life. And that's just, they just got into bad habits and they're good human beings. It's just, they get into those really bad habits.
it's also because of the internet just it doesn't do very well with like nuance and and you know sort of detailed arguments or anything like that. that doesn't do well on the internet right if you want if you want if let's say let's say the basic feeling you had watching me do my job let's say you know you're watching me at some event and for whatever reason the basic feeling you had was i'm not really enjoying this guy whatever the reason is you could try and do some sort of like nuanced argument to say, ah, I, you know, here's the reason why, and I think this is this is what's really going on. Chances are on Reddit, and certainly not on Twitter. I mean, Twitter is obviously the worst at it, but even on Reddit, where you can type as much as you want, chances are that kind of like detailed explanation is it's it's just not going to get like most people won't even read it, and it'll be you know it'll be too complicated. Uh, not that people don't understand it, but just that it will spawn like some sort of sub argument that, you know, you won't get the point that you wanted across. If you just say, I hate this guy, I think he's an idiot, then like it's the it's the easiest way to do it, right? Yeah. Then if that cuts right through, people see it immediately and that's what, you know, you and get then, no, the message I haven't said that. that. No, I did not say that. It's, just, it's a nice way to defend yourself yeah. by being cryptic about your, uh, you know, about your yes. insult or whatever. But in, in, in exactly. The, and the truth is that um, at, 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 the, at the end of the day, you know, you you can use this feedback and in, in, in a good way if, if you read good feedback and you're chasing for this feedback if you really care about your job, which is what you many times do. Um and, and, and some some people will give it to you kind of more specifically, some people will not. And and you just have to be fine with this with that whole thing, right? Um yeah. you said something before that it just gave me goosebumps because it's so true. When um Elon Musk like We've come into a point where I don't even watch live streams of um, of rockets flying into into space because it's just another day thing. Like this yeah. guy made rocket launch launching boring. Like you know what I mean? Like that, that <laughs> yeah, is, so much like of it expanding the threshold of what's possible, as you said yourself, and. This is, I have another perfect analogy for this. You know, there was a, before, like years and years ago, scientists said that, and I think I'm, I'm saying these numbers correctly. If I'm not, I'm sorry, but scientists said that you couldn't run a mile faster than four minutes. And, oh yeah, that changes all the time, right? Yeah, like, and, and they, did, they literally said it's physically impossible for the human uh, body to run the mile faster than four minutes. And, and what happened then, is that at some point somebody did, I mean, nobody did until that moment. And then at some yeah. point somebody did. And then in the same year, like 300 and something people did it again. Yeah. Like, and, and before that moment, nobody did it, you know? So it just goes to show that um, people like Elon Musk uh, and hopefully people like, who, you know, the, the one you strive to be, the one I strive to be, should always challenge the status quo and challenge what's possible because then the thresholds of what's possible grow and everybody's like oh shit we can actually make that happen oh shit we can actually make that happen and you don't artificially limit your goals or ambitions right there's something else that i i mean this is just about the the whole sort of space spacex thing which is once you once you pick a goal that's that you know crazy where you say okay we're gonna try and make sure that you know the human species could become like an interplanetary species that we can go somewhere like once you do that you realize that a lot of the local things that we struggle with, like local wars and stupid political differences, <laughs> like, like, it's like so inconsequential. Yeah, yeah, it it almost makes you want to say, like, listen, what we really need is to, for everybody to like be on the same page because this thing is so important that like let's let's forget about all the cultural differences. Let's just try and let's let's get all the people we can like educated so that we find the right people that are very good. Like we we know there may be like a, a bunch of Elons that are living in you know, sub-Saharan Africa or India or China. There's tons of them, right? And we, we just don't, like, there's so much of the population or the human population that lives there, but we can't get them online. Like, we can't, you know, we don't know that they're there yet. We can't find them because they don't have education or they don't have, like, so you want to get all those things up and running so that you can do that stuff, right? But you almost need the, you need, like, the cultural marker at the end of all of it so that you can yeah. say, well, why do we want people to not be starving? Why do we want education? Why do we want all these things? It's because we have this, you know, great goal somewhere in the future that's like, you know, about, you know, it sounds sci-fi, but like about saving humanity and no, about man. getting us away at, from the sun. At the end of the day, Earth. Anders, if you think about the people that use the people that use internet 
uh, proficiently. People that are uh, tech savvy or digital savvy and people that travel a lot tend to have pretty similar under uh, like beliefs, right? In the sense of, um, well, uh, they're just more open-minded. And I have to be very sensitive and careful with, with these things because I, <laughs> I, I, I never talk about politics. I don't like it. Um, but, <laughs> it's but dangerous. It, it, it's not it's dangerous. It's that I don't want the podcast to be about that. But, uh, but I do see these common denominators with people that travel a lot, are digital savvy, and very internet proficient, right? Or proficient in internet. And, and that is because we have access to all the information possible, right? Internet, like you don't have to pay for a personal coach anymore. You have the best personal coaches online. You don't have to yeah. pay for this book that used to cost you 250 bucks. You have everything you need to know online. That's how, that's why yeah. you are able to self teach yourself things. Uh, that's why you're, you just know more overall. And the problem that I find with what you said uh, and, and that's one of the problems, one of the issues that maybe people that believe in globalization and uh, like pure ultimate globalization, the problem that, that, that they, 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 I think, ignore is that there are a number of regions in the world that, of course, go by their own rules and their internet. And I'm telling you, it's all about the internet. It, that's at least what I believe in. Is just capped. It's capped in the sense of you can't get into every website you want. Or maybe they don't even, ha like most of the majority of this, of the of the community of that region do not have access to internet so it's all about internet if you have access to internet and you have no limits as to where you're able to get into the internet uh, within the internet then uh, then you will you will for the most part have a higher likeliness higher, higher chance of uh believing in similar things than these people believe in which is that, you know, you know, I guess a lot of religions are pretty similar and blah, blah, blah. A lot of good things, right? Which lead to that thought process that you mentioned yourself. But these countries that are closed in terms of their own rules and is just like detached, detached from the rest of the world. Yeah. That, that's a problem because if you open everything, then there's a huge cultural clash, right? Yeah, I mean, it's obviously very, It's I think it's very tricky, right? Because the kind of goal that we're talking about like that says we should try and we should try and save humanity from from the eventual death of this solar system which is which is going to happen eventually right so we should try and make sure that that that's not the end of humanity by by moving moving out somewhere into the universe then like that's a that's not a goal that you can just get everyone on earth to share all at once right but I think we, it has to start somewhere, right? And uh, you know, now obviously America is a, is, a, is a is a logical place for it to start because there's just like a long culture. There's this whole thing called American exceptionalism. Like there's there's all these things, right? That that sort of point towards that being the origin of it. But I don't. I think if it can start in one place, then it can it can spread. Like I mean, ideas are in that sense. You know, like in, Inception was right in that sense that like yeah, yeah, that's the that's the really hard part to get rid of. Like once an idea starts somewhere then it becomes incredibly infectious and like you just can't get rid of it right so i think that you know the people who are interested in this stuff should just keep like should just keep pushing these things forward and saying you know no we actually can dream much bigger we actually can try and do bigger things and and eventually more and more people will get caught up in it i mean it doesn't mean that there aren't local problems that need to be solved and obviously there are and i i don't know how to solve them the last time i had this um this experience where i realized that not everywhere on earth is the same was when we went to uh, to China, but it was off mainland China, it was on this island called Hainan, which is like very, felt like very sort of rural China. And and that's when I realized that Chinese culture is like so different from what I'm used to. Um, and I tried to think a lot about like, what would it, how would I even be able to explain the values of like mainstream Western culture to some of these people that live down here that obviously care about very different things, you know? Uh, cause in, like even just adjusting to it when I came there, like the pace is a little bit different. I, I remember seeing people that were, they were sort of like, there was some people were employed sweeping the parking lot of, uh, of like a hotel that wasn't even built. So there were no customers. There were never, no one was ever going to come, but they, but the parking lot looked incredible, you know, like they were sort of sweeping <laughs> in like, you know, and I remember thinking this is, you know, crazy. And I actually talked to some of the people that, you know, that work there and said, what is going on? Why are they doing this? And, and, you know, they sort of tried to explain to me, well, part of the, part of the problem is you're thinking that 
you know, but what about their careers? What about their future? You know, what, how are they going to sort of, and, and they might very well be thinking something like, well, this is sort of like the job that I've been given in life and, and I'm, and I'm fine with that. And then there are, there are other parts of my life that like you probably some sort of spiritual part of my life that, that I can move forward in instead, which is completely blind to me, or at least that part of it was kind of invisible to me until like a year and a half ago or something like that, where I started to think about, oh, there's like a whole part of life that Western culture has just ignored, which is, which is all the spiritual stuff. And I, I, you know, I'm, I used to be like a very hardcore atheist type. So, so that was fine by me. Ignoring all that was just no problem for me at all. Um, but I actually, I've, I've, I have tried to think a lot about it. Like, how would I be able to explain West? I don't even have to explain that it's better. That That's kind of not, that's kind of not really important to me, but just explain it to, to someone from China and say, like, you know, this is the kind of things that we value. What are the kind of things that you value? And how can we, can we find some common goals? And like, that's a, that's a problem that's like happening right now that I don't even know how to be able to solve. And it's true. Maybe the internet would be a, the, like, it certainly is an important tool to do it, but there seems to be like, there's some sort of plan that's missing or some sort of conversation that maybe we could have. That I just don't know how to have. Like, I'm just not the expert on doing this. But I think it's an interesting topic because, like I said, you want to get all those people online, right? You want to, to get them to a stage where, you know, if the right, you know, and a quantum physicist is out there that can figure it out, if they are, if they're, you know, if they're sweeping the parking lot in China somewhere, that's a, that's you know not good for humanity. I would say, like, there needs to be some sort of upgrade in that sense, and uh, yeah, that's obviously a crazy project and. And maybe we got a little bit off track, but, um, oh, I love but that. It, it's, it's been on my mind, you know. I, I love that. Do you see in the World Cup that the Japanese fans would just pick up everybody's shit? From... Yeah, I saw that. Man, that, that was, was very just, cool. That was amazing. And the, everyone was, would talk about it. And then you would see the Japanese people, like, not even like, they wouldn't even, they wouldn't even comment on it. They, this is just part of their culture, you know. And, and I was reading in Reddit, I remember there was a, a, a guy, a Western guy living in Japan. And it's like, you guys don't understand. Like, this is, this is literally their culture. Like, they will just yeah. clean, not only after themselves, but after anybody that doesn't clean, because they have, uh, they are, um, they feel responsible for whatever it is that other person did not clean. You know, it's just fucking crazy. Like, I find that, <laughs> I mean, I find that amazing. Not that, I mean, yeah, I would say that the Western world is, is, pretty dirty for the most part like uh, except you go some, some i mean Den denmark is actually quite nice i have to say um yeah. but um but there are there, there are countries and especially in the u.s it's just dirt it's just dirt on the streets and dirt everywhere and yeah they could benefit from that idea and that like that shit <laughs> a little bit yeah idea. a little bit so yeah. um I, i'd like to speak a little bit about about counter strike because it's a big part of your life of course and um yes and and I know you're super emotional about it in a good way, and and I want to hear kind of your story of how you got into all of this, which games you played, and what got you into the position you are today. A long one, but <laughs> oh man, I mean, so I I started playing Counter Strike in 1999, so that was I think right around like beta three point something, so like very 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 early on. Um, and like, we're going to have the 20th anniversary next year. So I really look forward to that. No shit. 20th uh, anniversary already. Yeah. Yeah. Next year is going to be it. So, um, the counter strike. Yep. That's a, that's a oh long time. Oh my God. I'm 28. <laughs> Wasn't yep. eight it, years old when that thing got, that's yep. insane. It's crazy. And, and this is actually, I think part of the strength of counter, like you said earlier that it's going to be very hard to sort of, not, you know, get rid of counter strike in a sense. And I think, and you said also that sort of people tend to recognize, like people who are famous in Counter-Strike tend to be recognized quite far outside of the world of Counter-Strike. And I think the reason for that is because it has become kind of like a, a shared cultural thing. Like, you know, whenever I see like some football player or basketball player that, you know, is famous and is a, is a millionaire somewhere else, and then, you know, they're playing Counter-Strike on, on, you know, in their spare time or something like that, it, it sort of tells me that, it's become like a shared cultural artifact between like a bunch of people. Yep. And that's, that's just very hard to get to that level. And I, obviously the time that it's been around is one thing, but there is something else about it that, that is like, that's just fundamental to what people enjoy and what people like doing. And I think that's a strength that it hasn't actually been exploited all that much by valve. 
And I mean, I don't know about this, the company that wants to do it, but there's something there that can really be built into the future. So I started, I started playing that. I mean, I, I guess before that, it would have been something like Wolfenstein 3D. It's like a, a shooter game or Doom 1 and 2 and stuff like that. My dad I used played, to play that. Yeah, I, I played that as well. And it was, it was very scary. I remember we were scared of playing yes. Wolfenstein, even though yes. I can't really explain That was why, really but. scary, man. Like, I remember the, the, there's this, this yell from that guy, from the Nazi guy. It was like that, that yeah. sound exactly. And I was so scared, you know, when you open the door and the guy is there. It's just so scary. It was it was just a, it was just a really fun game, right? And and then I played another <laughs> game that sort of came out. It was right around the time where I think Duke Nukem 3D came out. There's a there's a game on Macintosh, which I think later got moved to PC, but it was a, I I played on both uh, platforms back then as well. Um, that was called Marathon, which is made by Bungie. I think it's like the precursor to Halo. In was, some were they alive by then? They were alive back then. It was it was very strange. Not, Marathon not too much type, left in their uh... not too much left. No. <laughs> But um, so, so those, and then outside of the shooting uh, genre, the, the big game for me very early on became Diablo One, um, which, I mean, Diablo One and Two, I've spent such an enormous amount of time. I think it's an it's an amazing universe, and I, it's one that I care very much about. And I care I care about I like the story of it, but I care very much about the mechanics, especially of Diablo Two and how how that game is built and. That's something that I'm very passionate about. It, it kills me that Diablo 3 isn't made by to the same philosophy. It's really something that I know. I like the mechanics of Diablo 3, though. I mean, I, I kind of like it. It's just so smooth. I mean, it's a, it's it's a, a fun game. Yeah, it's a more commercial, much more commercial than Diablo 2. But I, well, I like the mechanics. I'll tell you what, um, because I do, I, do try and, I do try and pretend to be sort of a, a game... A, a, some sort of game developer critic in my, in my spare time. So... There's something that's happened to gaming, which I think is it's it's a natural side effect of it becoming so popular, like it overtaking you know music and and movies and all the rest of it, because there's such an enormous audience. It's very hard to convince your development team, and certainly very hard to convince the financing department that you should make a game that's you know I don't know if it, it doesn't even have to be hard for the for the broad population to access, but just that there has to be some sort of Deeper challenge. It's the learning curve it. is the learning curve. Like yeah. right now, the learning curve is like this is this is um, uh, the learning. This is the time. Right now, it's like this. Boop. And before, yeah. it was like this. You really yeah. need a lot of time to get very good. And the, what that what that does is that the harder the game is to learn, the bigger the player retention, the easier yeah. the game is to, uh, at, at first. The bigger the player acquisition. And every yeah company in the world at the moment, uh, every publisher is looking for acquisition, 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 market yeah. share, market share, uh, unique players, um, not even daily active players. They're talking about unique players only. We, we, that's why, yeah. uh, you know, that's why most of these games you play for one month and then you get bored. You're not yeah. a unique uh, daily player. You're just a unique player. And that, yeah. they tell these incredible numbers, <clears throat> right? So so I think part of the part of the issue with this is that it, it, it feeds a culture that, that where people, when you go and buy a game, you expect that, you know, you, you, you don't expect to have to put in any, like a, a, any large amount of effort. And in fact, if you encounter problems in the game early on, then instead of thinking at, of it as a challenge, we say, man, that's really challenging. I wonder how I can get past this, like this boss fight early on, very difficult, or, you know, I can't really, I can't really navigate the map quickly enough. So I keep losing the same mission or something like that. You don't think of that as being a challenge. You think of it as being bad game design, right? You just say, "Wow, this game is badly designed." I, you know what? What's going on here? And I, that I think is actually a very dangerous problem because I, I see it. Maybe this is this is sort of a slippery slope argument, but I really think that that's going to only continue, and it's going to be much worse because now, especially when five G internet is coming around soon, it's going to be even worse because people on mobile games are going to expect even more that they can. Like sit down, enjoy something quickly. Fifteen minutes not, done. Yeah, not too many obstacles. Let's just keep going. And I, I kind of wish that there was a game company. Now maybe there's one that I, I'm sorry about this. I'm not like super, super high on what game studios are using what philosophy. But it'd be cool if there was one that sort of openly said, "That's not our like. That's not our thing. We want to build games that do challenge people, that take a long time. But then you know, there's some some reward for doing it, which I think there was in Diablo 2, even though. 
Like, I'm not trying to say Diablo 2 was some... You, don't, you didn't have to be great at playing Diablo 2. It just took a long time to understand, especially the item system in that game. Like, I knew people who played that game for, like, five, six years in a row, and they still didn't understand, like, you know, half of what the items, you know, could actually do. Um, like... It was just it was just a very interesting thing to sort of to notice, and I think that that's pretty much disappeared Diablo three. But yeah, I think it's a it's it's just a it's a problem that's growing and growing all the time, and I I don't I know exactly right. know how to stop it, but I but I wish I did. And I, like you know, we talked about ideas earlier. I have I have at least three or four ideas right now that I'm that I'm writing down for different video games that I want to make if I ever get the budget for it. So. I, I wish I could uh, I could work in that area too. It's I know it's crazy, but like no, it, I mean the, the niche market works as well. It's just you're never gonna be the Activision Blizzard of the world. That's just it's a, a crude fact you have to deal with, uh, because it's true that attention span is decreasing as time goes by, um, and uh, kind of uh, acceptance of hard of difficulty is going away as well. Uh, and and as you said, it's because everything is more commercial now. Uh, as a result of 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 people, uh, I mean, the companies just wanted to make as much money as possible. And it's, it's it's not a bad thing because I mean, it's not a bad thing for more people than not because and and that's you know the fact on point is that they sell much more than they sold any time before because the audience there's more audience uh, willing to spend 15 minutes in a game than three hours straight. So let's let's say that let's say the two options you have is you can either I don't think this is but let's just let's just pretend that on the one side of the scale you can either create a like a, a very shallow game that has an enormous amount of players at some point in the beginning so you make a lot of money or or you could create a like a more elaborate game like a deeper game in some way but then you're not going to have as many players I I I can't pr- I've really thought a lot about it I can't really prove it but I think that there is a way to do both. Like I, th- I definitely think there's a way to do both. I think it's it's just that it's it's obviously difficult, and you probably you probably need like the right people employed in the right positions in a in a development company. But I have to believe that there's a way to do both. That you can actually create a game that is superficially appealing to a large amount of people, but there is a depth to it that's that's different. And I, I think that is a fi- a big challenge because. It's a huge challenge for sure. I don't even think I don't even know if it's possible because you gotta optimize for something, right? And every, everything you do, every feature you add into the game, every decision you take in regards to game mechanics and design has to be optimized for one reason. Is either one or the other? Is the game going <clears throat> to be easy to access, or is the game going to be hard to learn? Um, and, yeah. And that's I think the beauty of uh, Counter Strike. I'll just make it again. Because yeah. that's probably the game I've seen with the most amount of balance in which the depth, like you can always get better. You can always aim better. But that, yeah. and that is not an artificial barrier. That is literally a physical barrier. Like you can always aim better. And unless you're a robot, which you will never be, you can always get better. How many games like Counter-Strike are out there? So the, so, so the question with Counter-Strike is how come n- like 90% of the people who try Counter-Strike in the current gaming sort of market should say this game is really stupid i don't like i'm shooting at people but i'm not the bullets i'm connecting because the recoil is hard to figure out i don't like this game i'm just gonna quit you know and this is actually maybe we can talk about this this is actually the one well one of the few areas where i think esports actually legitimizes itself as a real like having a real value is because I think one of the reasons people don't do that is because they probably know that there are people out there who can control it. They've seen it in professional games. So even if they're experienced and, and like anyone who's seen a professional Counter-Strike game and then gone and tried to do what happens in, on like in the professional matches themselves has an experience of saying, my God, this is like worlds apart. What is going on? Like, why can't I control this gun? I swear I'm shooting right at this person and they're not dying. Like, it's very frustrating, right? But because of the culture around the esports side of it, I think, and also because of the history of it, but I think because of the because you know that it's possible to do it because you've seen the professional people do it, you kind of you accept the learning curve. Like you, you say, okay, fine, That's you know, a good point. I yeah, I want to do that. I want to become as good as those people. Whereas in a bunch, it's usually a new game that has no history. 
there maybe are almost no professional players. Maybe the best people are playing it are like streamers. Like maybe it's you know Ninja playing Fortnite. Maybe maybe you think that's like he's the best at doing it. I don't know if that's true, but let's say he is. Then you know the only thing you could say is I I, I want to be like as as good as Ninja is, but. But are you gonna are you gonna like put in you know an extra hundred hours to get to that level to to to, to be really good at Fortnite? Like let's say Fortnite was even more difficult. I don't know how to, I've never played it, but let's just say it was very difficult and and that you had to sort of like overcome some deep learning curve. Maybe you just don't do that because like there's no example on the other side of someone who's actually like done it and, and there's no no obvious career prospect for doing it. Like it's it, there's something missing there that's just very tricky and. And I think, unfortunately, what that does is it leaves esports as more sort of a marketing tool, you know, more than more than like something that can actually. Esports is undeniably a marketing tool. I mean, yeah. and that's not a bad thing because at the end of the day, many entertainment industries are a marketing tool too. Uh, sure. Yeah. At the, at the end of the day, it is undeniable that esports increases player attention and player acquisition, which is why you know the likes of Riot Games and Valve and Activision Blizzard are are betting on it. Uh, uh, but you know, and, and the, so that's undeniable. And 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 the problem that I do see um, with 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 this kind of trend that you mentioned is that indeed games are going towards the direction of simplicity, which as a result makes it really hard for uh, gifted players to show that to to win more often than people that are worse than them. Because if the skill cap is very low, then the var the variances are yeah uh, uh bigger in uh, sorry smaller in the sense of everybody's pretty much the same level yeah you may be one percent better but that one percent better may not be as impactful as if it would be in counter strike in counter strike maybe that one percent better would be actually be a five percent better and then you could win much more often tournaments and that creates a very shallow professional scene in which the only way for you to keep uh, of, as a publisher or as a league to keep the same names competing against each other is by artificially adding barriers, in other words, franchise models, uh, that keep things stable. Yeah, I mean, there, there are lots of ways to try and break this down, right? I mean, another popular way is to do, like, you know, matchmaking with MMR, MMR in it, right? So that you, you mostly play people who are the same skill group as you. But the problem is that, for the, first of all, to have like a real MMR landscape or take some time, right? Like you need the players to play first, right? And the problem is, I mean, I had this, I had this worry with something like o Overwatch in the beginning. Now I think Overwatch is still like it's still such a young game that I'm willing to give it quite a lot of runtime before I start getting very worried about what's going on. But let's say in Overwatch you add. Like every time you add a McCree or a Widowmaker or someone who has the ability to, you know, do headshots that do a lot of damage, you always run the risk of having a situation where someone who is incredibly mechanically skilled will be able to just destroy people. Like I'm not even talking about competitively. I'm just talking about someone you run into in, in regular matchmaking. That will spawn a whole lot of forum threads on the Blizzard side where people say, this must be nerfed because, you know, I've had like, you know, four out of 10 games that I've played. I just have like these people that always pick this hero. And every time I do anything, it's, you know, dead on headshot. And it doesn't matter to people whether or not it takes a lot of skill to do it. That's completely irrelevant. Their, their feeling yeah. is just that I'm getting beat up and I can't, I yep. can't stop it. It must change. You know? And then what's the publisher's answer? Well, they reduce the damage of headshots and they give him an ability. I'm just making shit up. Get, they give no, you an ability that happens. does like five shots uh, in a row in the body. And so all of yeah. a sudden, the skill cap decreases even more. So, and, and it's all a byproduct of what you just said. The, the, the mass audience playing the game and not wanting to, I mean, rightfully, but I think, spend right, and hours. I, I think that's, and I don't really blame it. I, won't, I don't really blame a, a developer for making that choice because maybe you actually have to, like, financially, you actually, like, you can't just justify saying, I mean, you have, well, yes. Yeah, you, you, you will just say to goodbye to like you know five million players. That's fine, but um, but I still would if I was if I was Blizzard or Al or anybody else, I would say okay, fine. We, we can't really change that fact, but what about the culture? What about the idea that there's like a culture in video games that says right now that things must get. I think they 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 use the euphemism that says like you know it must be accessible to everybody or like everyone must be able to participate. That sounds great, but. 
I think, but I would, I would say, let's try and push it the other way a little bit. Let's try and get to a point where, like, you embrace the fact that something is challenging, but you get the reward you get for accepting the challenge and spending some time on it is that, like, once you've really picked up a little bit, it feels really good. Interesting. Right now. Interesting. Um, like that. I, 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 I wish I had a really good plan for installing that culture, and I don't. But I think it's worth talking about or having like some sort of public discussion I hear you. about saying. Yeah. How can we push it that, that direction? Because I don't think we can change the market side of it. Like the market's the market, right? The market's and the market. And that's not going anywhere. Yep. So, so let's try and change the cultural side of it and say, it's fine. It's okay for a game to be you know, challenging. And you know, maybe we can help you by not having you play the best players in the game immediately. But somewhere down the line, you're going to start to run into players that are, that are reaching the height of some skill ceiling. And the only way to keep up is for you to get there as well. So, you know... Get to try and get there, you know. Interesting. Um, and I think I think Counter Strike does that. I mean, Counter Strike is perfect. Like, it's so unique, way, but it's it's close. It's so uniquely positioned. Uh, like I'm, I, I'm willing to bet. Twenty years from now, player base in Counter Strike is uh, proportionally similar to what it is today. Yeah, I think so. I'm willing um, to bet, and and, and that is yeah. just with minor changes. Valve maybe comes up with the next counter strike but based on the same mechanics i hope they don't fuck up lagging source uh i mean that, that was bad yeah <laughs> it was, yeah that was that was a bit strange um, I, th I mean i think i think it's gonna be it's gonna be hard to mess it up the way that it is now like, even if they put it onto so put a new game out of it i think it's gonna be very similar but here's the really crazy thing um most of the time, I think most people who, who play or in, engage with or interact with Counter Strike, I actually think have almost no idea about some of the fundamental sort of theory that, like, people understand, like, people know that they have to get good mechanically. So they play A maps, they play deathmatch, they spend all this time doing this thing. But there's like a, we, we, we started referring to it a lot as like the chess game in Counter Strike, which is about, you know, just fundamental theory about. How do you manipulate the other side's setup? How do you make sure that you know your offense is attacking their weakest part of the defense? All the rest of it, like that part of the game, is it's very very badly published by all of the people who, who work, including myself, in in this area. And that's something that I think can change a lot with this game in the next couple of years. That we can actually start to get to a place where we can say we've actually really fleshed out the fundamental theory of it. We actually really know what's going on. And the fund, I mean, yeah, I, th I just think that, that that's something that could get very interesting soon, that we could get to that spot that we can we can start to include more people in that. And I think that will keep even more people around for the game and, and get more people interested in it. So what is your reaction if I tell you, imagine I am, my name is uh, John, and I tell you, hello, Anders, Fortnite is an eSport, it's the biggest eSport. What is your <laughs> initial reaction? I mean... Uh, Whenever, whenever people, you obviously, we all see these articles published in like Forbes or something, and some are like, you know, you Coca Cola esports or something, and someone says, you know, oh, this is the new, you know, the, this is the biggest esport right now. I mean, obviously, the, the big question is by what metric? Do you mean in terms of prize pool, in terms of, you know, how many players play it, how many professional teams there are? Like, it's always very hard to, you can probably make it look however you want, right? Um, I agree with what you said earlier that that esports is a marketing tool. But I'm going to be a, as a little bit of an elitist and say that I think there are some that are like more legit esports than others mm -hmm. in the sense that they have like a, there's like a deeper sports function beyond the, beyond just the, the idea that you can sell more copies of the game or whatever. I actually think some company, I, I, I know I'm not going to blame anyone for doing this, but I think that there are some companies that say, like, let's say you're making a new version of FIFA, right? Like, I've never played a FIFA game, but let's just say it's like FIFA 2020. That's what you're making. And you have a choice. You can, you have, a, let's say your advertising budget is $200 million or something. And you can either try and buy, you know, you could buy advertising at an actual FIFA event, or you could, you know, buy advertising in a cinema. So when the next blockbuster film is out, that's where you put your advertising. Or... You can go to a tournament organizer and say, listen, why don't we have a prize pool of $50 million and then we'll attract a bunch. Like, it's, it's great advertising, right? Like, if it works, then it works and then it, it serves as the same. But there's something, there's something slightly 
absurd about the esports community immediately saying, well, now that's, you know, like I, I know that I'm going to get, <laughs> but to me, that's like something that's, that feels wrong, you know, like it feels a bit weird that people can, can do that. And then that immediately we're talking, we're talking esports on the same level as some of the, some of the stuff that has been around for a long time. Um, and I don't know how to, I don't even want to stop it from happening. I just don't know how we make the distinction. Like I actually have no plan for how we can, how we can divvy it up, but it is a bit, I think it, it is a bit weird and it does just make a lot of instability in the, in the, in this world, because what happens is like Fortnite coming out and saying that they're putting a hundred million into esports in the first year or whatever, like that. That immediately, like, you see a lot of teams that suddenly, oh, well, then we have to have a Fortnite division, and we sort of put that up, and then we spend time and resources on that, and we like, I feel like it's just creating a fair bit of instability all over the place where people suddenly have to worry about, you know, these other games, and maybe you only want to be in one shooter game at the time, and I obviously want everyone to be in Counter-Strike, but I realize that if, if you're some high-level team, it's, it can be really hard to have a, you know, a Fortnite and a Counter-Strike and a PUBG team and a No-Watch team, like, they're all shooter games and how do you, how do you make sure you, you pick the right one? Um, and I just think that's there's something weird about that. I, I realize that it sounds super elitist and if you're into Fortnite, it probably sounds like I'm saying your game is not a real game, but I just think it's like, I would rather it grew over time than someone just throwing in a lot of money right off the bat and saying, here we go, it's esports, you know? I hear you. I hear you. It's it's <laughs> tough. I, I don't have an answer either, to be honest. No, I, um, I don't. And and many times I, w I will be seen by these new people as a purist. Um, uh, yeah. But it's just, at the end of the day, when I, you know, same story as when people say, I don't like, you know, I draw a red line with violent games. And I'm like, you know, when I kill somebody in Counter-Strike, I'm just showing that guy that I'm faster more accurate or smarter than him or all three. Yep. And, and, uh, and I feel like we're losing that a little bit, you know, we're losing that in the sense yep. of right now is a bit more up to chance, whether you win or lose uh, a lot of RNG involved, uh, increasingly. So a lot of, you know, matter of positioning and it's just, it's just, it's not, it's not that kind of feeling that I used to love of mastering something. So I'll tell you a, a, a quick story about it's one of my, it's one of my favorite examples of the difference between something that could be esports and something that, that couldn't be. And it's, it's team fortress two. I actually think team fortress two could have, could have been more than it was, but there were some mechanical, uh, sort of basics in the game early on that made it, I would say very unsuited to, to esports. And one of the examples would be, in, in T42, in the, in the first release of it, there was something called uh, like a, a base crit chance. So that was that was a 2% in the beginning. So, you know, you fired 100 rockets, two of them would be a critical rocket, which did like, I don't know, four times the damage and had a bigger radius and stuff like that. And I actually think, I would love to talk to the specific developer who came up with this idea because it's kind of genius. What it, what it does is even the worst player in the game, 2% of the time, and by the way, it's scaled with damage. So if you did more damage within an interval, then it would okay. go from two to like, it would sort of ramp up a little bit. So if you did a lot of shots in a row, you would, you'd get more critical hits in, in a sense. But even if you didn't, even if you hit nothing at all, then like every once in a while throughout a game, because in Team Fortress, you shoot 100 rockets fairly often if you're playing Soldier or something. But some, suddenly you would have a feeling that you were doing something, that you were contributing because those critical rockets, they were like, you know, you just have to hit somewhere in the area of somebody else. And, you know, if they're a little bit low, then they'll just disappear. So there's you will win material that if there's two in a row. Exactly right. You just have this, like, you just feel like I am, like, I did something, you know, and if you're playing with your friends, then, you know, you get like, a, you know, you brought three people in one rocket and they'll come up in the corner and like the kill feed and, you, you know, you get that feeling. So it's like a reward mechanism for people who are otherwise fairly useless at the game. <laughs> but the problem is, as much fun as that is, Nobody wants to see the finals of a you know of a ten million dollar Team Fortress Two tournament be decided by somebody getting a two percent you know crit rocket. Now it was this disabled later on in competitive Team Fortress, um, which is fine. That's great that they figured out to do that. But it serves as a really great model, I think, for explaining the underlying problem that you're talking about. Is with whenever you introduce random elements into the game, then that removes some of the competitiveness, like it just does. 
Dota had the same problem, right, with the damage interval, mm -hmm. where, you know, you would do, if someone does between 25 and 100 damage in level 1, and you have a fight versus them, if they just hit four, ro four hits in a row where they do, like, you know, plus 90 damage, because it's just random, then, like, they just win that fight immediately. And it, and it makes no sense, because, the, you know, it's not like anyone did anything wrong, it's just that the dice happen to roll that, you know, four times in a row. So they had to sort of, you know, make that, that interval a little bit more narrow. Which is good thinking, and I mean, I wouldn't expect anything less out of the, the Dota 2 people, but still, um, I think that kind of thing is, again, it's the same problem, just from a different different perspective, which is that the more randomness you add, to a certain extent at least, the more people feel like, like the people who are bad at the game don't recognize that they got rewarded by something random. They just yep. feel like, great, I won. Yep. You know, that, that was cool. But the people who play at a competitive level are going to think, well, stupid you know like i i just lost yeah, this is what i'm talking story. about when i'm telling you that that you have that like any any anywhere you go right now you always carry that ex experience with you and and that is yeah. invaluable because nobody that comes in new or that came in five years ago even understands any of that um they just don't and and you, you know you may be right in being a purist you may be wrong it may not be neither wrong nor right but having that information is very valuable to know what's going to work or not going to work next. Um, I had I had another radical idea that oh, go we, ahead. We can, I'll I'll yeah. just put it out there and Please. then like I'm I'm not I'm not you know I'm not married to this this idea. I just think it's it's worth saying out loud and maybe someone can someone smarter than me can come up with a with a really functional model. But let's pretend that we took the the ten smartest people who work in esports and we and we made them into like the, the esports council so in order for anything to be to be esports it has to be in some way managed and approved by these 10 people like the association I, I, or federation so yeah something like that now i realize there's tons of political issues so let's not worry about who those people are i don't think i trust 10 people in esports enough to, uh, <laughs> to 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 find them but let, but let's just forget about that um let's say you take those 10 people and then let's say valve develops a new counter-strike like counter-strike 3.0 that's what they come up with and then they go to the this federation and they say, we want this approved as an esports by you guys. In order for them to do that, they would, Valve as a developer would have to give up some part of, like they don't have to give up the whole game because that doesn't make any sense, but they would develop, they would give up some control of what could happen to the game after it had been approved as an esports, right? Like you couldn't just institute uh, crazy loot box gambling or, you know, like th there would be, there would be some regulations there. And also, you know, just, patch changes you couldn't just suddenly introduce like a laser gun that could shoot through walls and stuff like that and then my, my dream would be that this would allow for you know outside sponsors and people who wanted to invest into a particular sport to no longer be sort of prisoners to whatever the hell the developers wanted to do like because th that's a that's a really silly problem that we have right now is that the developers essentially hold absolutely all of the power right uh, like at any given point, they could just withdraw the right for any tournament organizer to, 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 you know, run a game and just say, that's it. You're no longer licensed to be, to be broadcasting our game and whatever, any sponsor that has invested into that will just immediately have lost all of their money for no good reason. So that I, like I said, this is not a, you know, a very sort of purely formulated idea, but it, it's an interesting thought. I think that, that, you know, there's something missing there that that's a little bit weird, like in football. It, theoretically, you could make a, a competitor to FIFA if you had enough money and could, could persuade all the teams or whatever to come and join you, right? Whereas in in, in esports, you're always going to be stuck under the developer. And it's not because they're all evil mm -hmm. or something. That it's just how it is, you know. Uh, but it would be an interesting thought for someone smarter than me to, to think about. I definitely say, well, think there's some, some sort of... Um, there's going to exist some sort of association or something like that. Um, and I think that it'll fail plenty of times in the process uh, yeah, because politics are you know people have uh, uh, personal ambitious uh, ambitions sorry and politics are a thing and yeah. you know you get your friend from whatever inside that group and blah, blah blah and all of a sudden you lose that pragmatism and that kind of neutral point of view that you need in a place like that yeah. um, but I do think that there has there will at some point be an overarching body that is agnostic to games and platforms and that will determine the minimum standards in regards to what's acceptable 
in terms of what's not acceptable. Um, and yeah. it will be an unofficial thing because at the end of the day, nobody owns those games except the publisher. But I think publishers that intend to be in esports will thrive to uh, have the recognition of that group. Yeah. And the recognition of that group should only be given if certain standards are met in terms of yeah. production quality, in terms of the actual mechanics of the game, and the, maybe the skill cap of the game, I don't know. In terms what of What kind XYZ. of data you can get out of the code? Exactly, like that's, 100%. That's issue. You know, is it open source? Like, you know, and I guess you can earn points or lose points regard, uh, regarding all of those things. Uh, because there's there's something to consider here, which is that uh, most of the esports, as we purists know them, are uh, are a um, um, version, a game mode of an already existing game. Yeah. Counter Strike comes from Half Life, and somebody just created it. Um, yeah. Dota comes from Warcraft Three, and somebody just made it. And after Dota, yeah. League of Legends and blah 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 came out. And uh, you know, Battle Royale, uh, DayZ, I think it was, right? The first one, or Arma 3, I, can't yeah. be, I think it was DayZ. Like but, but somebody just went and created it, right? So all these game modes are, are, are have been born out of already existing games because uh, there was open source to code game modes yourself. And right now we are a little bit losing that. Uh, and I feel like that is a crucial aspect, uh, aspect of what makes esports esports. Right now you see a lot of instances in which games are born and before people demand that tournaments happen within those games, the publisher is doing like, oh, take your eSport, you know, and they just down your throat, right? Yeah. And it may be that people love it uh, or it may be that people were not quite asking for it. And in that case, then uh, you have an artificial number of viewership, I mean, number of viewers that are maybe watching because of drops or whatever it is, right? Yeah. Uh, and on the other hand, you look at uh, League of Legends, you look at Dota, you look at Counter-Strike, you look at Battle Royale, like all these games either watched or played, have been watched or played because people demanded to watch or play them. It's yeah. not because the publisher had that as number one choice. So I'm just saying that there is a, there is a definitely there's a shift going on. And whoever is the publisher that gets this right, in other words, whoever is the publisher that opens the source of the game and, and allows people to create their own game modes and incentivizes them to create game modes in a way that they can monetize and make a livelihood yeah. out of create fucking sick game modes is when yeah. you will see esports probably in my mind just take off because you will have four or five new, new genres over the course of two, three years that are going to be insanely well developed, insanely well thought out, insanely well balanced. There will yeah. be people that create companies only for the purpose of building these game modes to, because they will be able to monetize it. And that in and by itself is a business vertical that today doesn't exist and will uh, will just improve whatever it is exists today so much. Yeah, I I mean, I think this is, this is a really, really good point. I think if you think about the way that modding happened for warcraft 3 right which obviously as you said like you know people play dota and all the rest of it or you know even maybe earlier than that warcraft 2 had some mods as well but warcraft 3 had you know like tower defense and like all these crazy yeah. game modes that's like, amazing you know, it was so much fun and like i actually sometimes miss i i almost Same. want to install warcraft 3 just to go back and play you know all the crazy things that were going on oh there we go no, it's okay you're back yeah, my my monitor jumped for some reason. Um, the footman so, frenzy or the you know the it's, tower defense, whatever. Like all those. Yeah, it's amazing. All of those things, right? And here's the thing: what if what if whoever came up with with some of those, like, let's say you made a really popular map, why shouldn't you, in some ways, be able to to sort of have some sort of profit from it? Of you know, if it becomes super popular, I understand that you know Blizzard in this case would want to retain the the actual ownership of the of the you know the IP or whatever, but it would be super interesting. And this is true in other spaces too. Like you remember early on in, in World of Warcraft when people would come up with like UI modifications and then a bunch of times what happened is that whatever you want, UI, whatever mod people would make, it would essentially be incorporated into the game later on. Yeah. So people yeah. were just, you know, for free developing stuff for Blizzard to, to code into the game, which is like, you know, why not give people the, like, there's already a market. imagine if you pay them, like the, the, the yeah. things would be of 10x the quality. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. Or even if it was just a marketplace where people could sell it, you know, like that's exactly a what I mean. And, yeah, and in World of Warcraft, where people can buy, you know, items, why can't they buy a UI upgrade in there as well? And someone could do that, and it, and it would be interesting, right? Um, and you could take a percentage. I mean, you I assume you would because that of course you're the publisher, crazy, you own it. But, uh, so yeah. Right, 50%, 50-50, and you'll monetize a new business vertical that you did not have before. By the way, you did not have that business vertical, that kind of revenue source before. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, I, I think that a publisher will come up with that. And it has to be a publisher, uh, ideally, that owns the game engine as well. So Epic Games is well positioned because they own Unreal, right? Um, yeah. So, it, but it, I feel like that is going to be key. Yeah, I agree. That's, I, 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 thought about something similar as well before and i i do think that, that we've lost i mean you know we talked about warcraft 3 but you, you said for half-life there was you know people know counter-strike and maybe you know like day of defeat and i used to play a game that was called natural selection which was uh, oh my god i loved that game yeah natural selection was an extremely good game now unfortunately natural Selection 2 was not so good in my opinion, um, and I actually I knew I knew two or three of the developers that worked on on Natural Selection One, and one of the issues is the final patch I think was released was like three point two or something. Um, that was that was coded in large part by a lot of developers that weren't working on Natural Selection Two, but that game was incredible. Now here's the here's the thing though, outside of those three or four games that people know, like another people will, will remember like Action Half Life and stuff like that. But there was there was a, there was something called like Half Life mod database that had like no joke three hundred different mods and it, like every week you could go in and there'd be new ones. I've played like ridiculous Half Life mods with friends that were like some of them you were like one of my favorite ones early on was something called Pirates Vikings and Knights, which actually I think was made for Source as well. But that was uh, like an absolutely genius concept that could immediately be copied to a modern game and it would it would immediately be fun to play. Um, but there were other ones that were just like completely ridiculous. There was one where you were like, I think you were ice skating around like a snow snow themed world, <laughs> and you had to like shoot each other while you were doing it. It was completely unfun, but it was really poorly made. But it didn't matter. It was fun. It was just so much fun. And that whole that whole atmosphere has died. And Bro, that's we, we may be the getting fact- into the into the topic. I mean, we may be getting into the core of the of the opportunity here, actually. Because yeah. what if a game that's shallow? like Fortnite could be considered, would have this open source. And then people would just create their own mods and people, they just people, let people choose, you know? Right. So the first, thing that would happen, the first thing that would happen if you allowed people to, to manipulate Fortnite is someone would make a competitive Fortnite. They would literally call it like, there you, you know, go. competitive Fortnite. And then they would remove whatever things that they thought were an obstacle to it and it would evolve over time. And then eventually the esports part of Fortnite would probably just become that, you know? You got and it. and people and then and if Epic were smart and and if they if they wanted to support it and instead of fighting it they said actually we'll we'll lend you some of our coders we'll help out we'll like we'll make we'll be because everyone will profit from this so we'll just we'll work on this together somehow yeah it could be super great and then maybe somebody decides hey let's make like a game based on this engine and we can also try and, like it, there's no reason it has to stop anywhere yeah I absolutely agree I think that's that there's there's a huge portion there that's lacking and it's not I mean. I'm guessing money is the reason why, but I'm not sure. But it's, 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 exactly. it's, it's not even money, because if this works, then you're the winner, period. Uh, uh, like Valve is still milking Counter-Strike and Dota, and, and they're literally not caring at all. They're doing, they're doing nothing. They're just putting in some money, that uh, some, some of the leftovers from Steam. <laughs> they're just putting money in for the prize money or whatever, and that's what they're doing. They let everybody else do the stuff, which is not a bad thing. But I'm just saying that once you're in a position where that open source uh, ecosystem it's just auto sustainable because people want to uh, renew re- refresh the way in which they entertain themselves and people yeah. will come up with new shit especially if they get paid for it so you know one of the best things i i, I paid i played sorry is uh counter strike 1.6 warcraft 3 mod where, <laughs> where you yeah. know the, the human was like invisible i think and the you can elf, have life steal, orc, orc grenades. Yeah, orc grenades. You had like four kills in, in the single nade. That was insane. Like I actually, I actually had, I actually proposed this like a couple of tournaments ago. I said, why doesn't a 
like if you could make a Dota 2 mod for CSGO, because then it's the same franchise, right? You have, it's all Valve, but then you could play as, you know, Life Stealer or whatever yeah. else you like. It, people, I think people would like the crossover and it could like, 100%. It could sort of make a crossover between the two communities. That'd be interesting. A hundred percent. So we, yeah, we, we got into the, into the core of it, man. I, I like that so much uh, because I believe, I mean, I, I generally believe that what, you, what we just discussed is like true. I just see evidence uh, everywhere yeah. about it. So uh, somebody will, somebody will come. Like people and are, these people are super smart. Somebody will about, come up with this. Think of the resources we have now. Like back when all this modding was happening, right? To find a Warcraft 3 mod, you had to like browse this ridiculous list in inside of the game, or you had to go visit a web website that where you could like download the map and there was like some obscure rating system. I remember it's very yeah. hard to figure out what maps were good and what weren't, or if you even had the right version of it. Like there was all these like, you know, like beta 3.2.5. Like you had to find the right version yeah. of it. It was very tricky, right? And the same for Half-Life mods. It was like you had to install them and you had to like copy things from one directive to another one inside your PC. Now we have Steam, we have Twitch, we have like think of the exposure if you had this kind of community. It would just be insane, you know. Like you have so many and more better tools like Unity has come out in the meantime where people can actually just create a bunch of stuff themselves yeah. or like unreal has their own their own editor as well right so people who are into modding would they have so many opportunities to do this and it's it's just not happening you know um and it, it is a real shame it absolutely is all right man so i think that we for how long are we is always speaking already production <laughs> an hour and a half yeah. shit that's perfect what, yeah, what, what i'm in no hurry right? <laughs> uh, do you have fun in the conversation i mean i think this is like literally one of the best podcasts we had it was amazing i appreciate it i love it i mean i i just uh i i enjoy this i enjoy this because so often like i said this to you your guys when you guys emailed me and i say to every everyone i talk to every journalist i don't care where they're from most of the time um i tell them listen you can just ask whatever questions you want like we talk about whatever you want right and Invariably, what people do is they just say, so, you know, how's this tournament been? Uh, you know, what's your next tournament? Like, it's just like, why doesn't anyone ever, you know, say something crazy, you know, like... I know. Uh, wh wh like, they could just do that. Like, I'm it's, I'm hard to offend, man. Like, it, it, you know, <laughs> I, I, I'm fine with people asking three questions if they want, but nobody ever does. And it's like, I just, I prefer this where we can just talk about, you know, random stuff and it's just more fun. So I, I really enjoyed it, man. I enjoyed it so very much, man. You really are the best. And, and I, I, you know, I, 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 we had some conversations, but not, of course, never as, as deep as, as this time. And I think you're a really, like, really nice like, human being. I think it really, it really <laughs> that, like, you're so wholesome always. Um, you, I never see you involved in any drama, uh, any, any, you know, it's just, you're just happy there. You're just doing your job properly. You don't shit on anyone. I mean, not that it's bad to have banter or anything, but you just you're just there and just enjoying yourself. And yeah, I can clearly see that you're having a blast. Uh, and I yeah. hope that people also uh, see the same thing. So, uh, do you want to say anything to anybody watching? Uh, no, just thanks for watching. It, I had a really good time. Hope you guys had a good time as well. Um, and you know, if you if, if you're if you're, I would say this: if you're if you're some sort of you know millionaire that's out there that want to fund my crazy ideas, then you can just find me on Twitter <laughs> or something. And we'll, actually, we'll funny, figure it out. funny story: this podcast is actually watched uh, by large part, um, maybe not live, but online when it's in YouTube or when it's in uh, either Spotify or SoundCloud or iTunes or whatever. It's watched by, um, like, we send it out to all our investor base. We send it out to, like, decision makers Perfect. and things like that. <laughs> I should have told you that before, maybe. But uh, <laughs> we, we, always, uh, we always send it because um, these people lack what you have, which is those 20 years. I'm serious. Those 20 years playing Counter-Strike or watching esports develop, looking at esports develop, they will never have that. Never, ever, ever. Doesn't matter how much money, doesn't matter how many people they know, how many people they have in their team, doesn't matter. They will never have that. So these conversations for them are incredibly valuable. And this awesome. is, I also like to do this for them uh, so that they can learn the in and outs. Yeah. And not everything is Fortnite. Not everything is cartoony and easy. Uh, you know, <laughs> the dreams are built or have been built differently for us. Yeah, I really appreciate it. I know I just, I just had a good time and I'll come back anytime. And oh, absolutely, man! I, I would, I would love it. I would love it. And if you have uh, anything going on, I'm, I'm happy to help as well. 
and, and anything you you have in mind we're happy to help us you too or myself okay awesome man thanks thanks so much man and for everyone okay uh, production am i in the right camera mm -hmm. i am and for everyone watching i appreciate so much that you guys have been here uh, i enjoyed this meeting oh in this meeting uh, this is not as informal i mean as formal sorry i enjoyed this uh, podcast so much uh, he you know anders is amazing he's is always so positive and he has incredible insights actually and an experience that i didn't know he had actually uh, so all great news uh, I'm, i want to apologize because what we do is uh, we record or no, not record sorry we um we have we, we go to discord and have a conversation uh, in there and the problem of discord is that sometimes the audio uh, like every now and then you will listen there's like for some milliseconds the voice would stop uh for uh for anders so i apologize for that it's not too annoying it really is not but i apologize in advance um actually it's not in advance because the podcast is over i should have said that earlier production you have to fucking help me here you you can't do this you cannot do this i'm gonna rename you to alex by the way if anybody that got that joke uh <laughs> please laugh, laugh for me oh um anyway to finish an outro will be played after um, this, Carlos R. talking. And in the outro, I'll be promoting the YouTube Esports website where you can buy things in the shop. But before I promote the shop, let me promote the shop. G2Esports.com slash shop. You got some jerseys from different countries. Oh, thanks very much. This is one of the jerseys that you can buy. Is that my name on it? Why do you have... A jersey with my name on it, and I do not have a jersey with my name on it. What the fuck is this? This doesn't make any sense. So that's the black one. That's the... Oh, say can you see? American one. This is the one that I like to use uh, when I get funky. When I get frisky, you know. Um, it does not have my name on it, but it should. Pink. Beautiful. <laughs> this is the inverse version. Yeah, what can I say? We produce a lot. <laughs> the inverse version, which is beautiful. And so much more. We love you so much. Anders is a fucking legend. Anybody that watched, you guys are fucking legends. And now, roll the outro. The outro. We need to sell more stuff. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the show. With that said, you know, this show exists because of you guys. We want to teach you about esports. We want to entertain you. And for that reason, please provide us with which topics do you think we should be speaking about which people do you want us to invite and um, yeah with that said please head over to g2esports.com shop uh, we do our best efforts to create the best possible merchandise for you guys so please check it out uh, buy anything you like and see you on the next podcast see you on the next episode